summer series. I'm Sandra Leah, Director of Education and Patient Advocacy at Obesity Matters. Meet my co-host, Rachel Atkins. Hi, everyone. I'm Rachel, Director of Strategy with Obesity Matters. Obesity Matters is a nonprofit organization for people living with elevated weight and obesity. It was formed by patient advocates whose focus is to provide evidence-based education and advocate for policy change and environmental changes that enable well-being. If we can do that, we are one step closer to the acceptance and inclusion of millions of people in larger bodies. Obesity is a medical condition, and we hope that this empowers you to release any shame or guilt you may be carrying. There are many contributing factors outside of your control that cause obesity. We here at Obesity Matters are bringing together a community of seekers open to finding a solution aimed at healing the mind, body, and spirit. Together, we'll create a community of enlightened and connected people who nourish and love and accept our body. To get connected, please visit our website at obesity matters.com. The Eat, Play, Love Summer Series runs a weekly interactive events with experts. The first half of the episode will be an interview, and then we'll turn the spotlight on the audience on you to address any questions and comments in a very safe and supportive environment. This season, we are focused on answering the question, what matters most to our community? Uh, at our first session today, mapping out the patient journey, Dr. Sean Wharton will address how adults living with excess weight should be treated within the healthcare system. One that is personalized, practical, evidence-based with the goal of improving health and well-being instead of focusing on weight alone. I would now ask Dr. Wharton to introduce himself. Hello, hi guys, I'm Sean Wharton. I'm an internal medicine doctor working in Toronto and also in the Hamilton area. I am originally from British Guyana in the West Indies. And then I arrived here in Canada in the late 1970s. I'm not gonna give you all those details, I'm old. Um, <laughs> been around for a while. And then I went to the University of Toronto for my medicine. And my residency was at McMaster in Hamilton. During that time in my, my residency, um, I recognized that we were treating type two diabetes, hypertension, and a lot of medical conditions, when in fact, the real challenge in the room was a patient had significantly elevated weight, and we didn't know what to do about it. We didn't want to talk about it. We didn't want to address it because it would open a can of worms, and we had no treatment options. We were just horrible at it, and it made me feel terrible. I, I just didn't understand why we wouldn't deal with it and treat it. Um, uh, so therefore, I decided to go into this the field of, of weight science and trying to figure out why people go up in weight, how they can go down in weight, how they can stay down in weight, why it's so challenging. Where's all the stigma coming from, the social challenges, um, uh, and how that connects to it. So since that time, I've been working within the obesity medicine field. We've seen advances in 15 years that uh, we have not seen in this field for a long, long time. So, and, uh, and I'm happy to work with this amazing crew of people on how we can make things better. Oh, it's so great to have you back and we thank you for being so generous with your time. Our audience has several questions from the previous session and we're hoping to get through some of them today. Um, my first one is how have the guidelines redefined obesity beyond just elevated weight? That was probably one of the most important things we did within the guidelines is we changed the definition of obesity from a definition of BMI. And BMI is really about size, how big a person is. And um, the idea is, is obesity is not defined by size or bigness. It's more so defined by if there is adipose tissue or fat tissue that causes inflammation, that causes a medical condition. So that would be things like polycystic ovarian syndrome, fatty liver, diabetes, or emotional challenges. The excess weight causes an emotional stress and stress eating and psychological damage to me that's painful. That in itself is obesity, not size. So, and the reason why that's really important is because if you're an African-American woman 
and you carry your weight in your thighs and in your buttock area, no disease. That's just looking good. There's no disease connected with that. And it really frustrates me when people say that, that this person is in obesity class one. They should be defined as having obesity and then they need obesity treatment and then they need this and they need that. No, they don't. They need, they need to be accepted as the person that they are, a terrific person. If you happen to be an indigenous person in Canada and you have a BMI of 26, that's quote unquote considered not all that high, but you have um, the fat is primarily in the central area. You have these thin little legs, no fat in the buttocks, no fat in the thighs. It's all right in the belly and it's causing type two diabetes and fatty liver. You have obesity and that would require treatment if you wanted it um, to help that those medical conditions to get better. Or even if it was psychological challenges from as a BMI of 27, but they went from BMI of 24 up to 27 rapidly. They have parents who are, are have uh, medical conditions due to elevated weight. That's obesity because that can be treated as well because there's a real significant issue here. So move away from size, move to talking to the person. Um, and this is uh, why um, our patient advocacy group really told us that. They're the ones that helped us to, to understand our own science. It's our own science. I'm, we know what the science is, yet for some reason we weren't applying it. Patient advocacy group told us that well, you guys are missing the boat here. Um, uh, really try to understand the patient versus just trying to understand BMI or size. And, you know, we are so grateful to the guidelines because in, in a way it is promoting body diversity. It is promoting body acceptance. I mean, I know there's other ladies out there who are like, yeah, butt and hips, those are good. That's not a bad thing. We just got to get over ourselves and accept that bodies come in every size and shape and look at it only when it becomes a health concern. Um, so I want to ask you another question. There are many stages in a patient's journey, and I want you to describe those and how people can seek help. Right. So we decided to have this stepwise journey within the, um, uh, within the, the whole guidelines. We called it the patient journey. And the patient journey really started with um, uh, the first part, which is the recognition that we should ask patients if weight is a challenge and if they want to work on, on, uh, on, uh, on weight. We don't assume that somebody does and we don't um, uh, assume that they've been treated properly previously um, when we addressed weight. Um, so this has been a big gap for a lot of family doctors. Um, uh, like the person comes in, they have high blood pressure and their weight's really high. What do you mean I should ask them if I should address their weight? Of course I should, because I'm the doctor, I'm in charge. No, you shouldn't. You should ask them um, if they would like to discuss weight. And they may tell you no. Why? Because they've had a lot of bad experiences in the past and there's trauma and it's not time to discuss it. They need time to believe that you're gonna be nice to them. Um, and that's the first part in the patient journey is recognizing the person and the patient and asking them if you can move, you, you, can, you can move forward. Then we have an assessment. We talk about the assessments and what are the medical conditions that are challenging. May they be psychological, depression, um, anxiety, or diabetes, heart disease. Um, and then we look at the treatment options. There's actual real treatments. They, there weren't 15 years ago. They were, they were very bad because we probably didn't do the other things well either. But fortunately things have come around nicely where we actually have treatments at work in the next 20 years we'll have even more treatments so we're open to understanding treatments and we're humbled by our our, our new understanding of this this difficult field um, and then we go to the idea that we should follow up with patients on a regular basis because everybody changes you this year will not be the same person as three years from now, four years from now, five years from now, your situation changes, your social situation changes, your body changes, your brain changes, and you, we need to change, we, uh, the treatments may change, the way that we approach it may change. So, so don't ever think that, oh, I've got the answer, or I'll do this, and it'll work forever. No, it, we will work with, you'll continue to work with people forever as you, we make changes. So that's the that's the, that's the whole wrap. Starts with the patient and ends with the patient. Not what doctors are accustomed to doing. We're not accustomed to starting with the patient. We're accustomed to starting with ourselves and our egos and how great we are at science and medicine. Um, and we try to smash that and say, start with the patient and find out whether they even want you to address 
what what you what we would like to talk about what we'd like to talk about that's brilliant sean thank you so much for that uh overview if i can maybe i could flip uh, the view and the perspective on that a little bit. You know, a lot of people in our community since we chatted last time have been asking questions about, you know, the fact that there is uh, a lot of bias and stigma in the system is really holding them back from taking that first step of that patient journey. So what kind of advice do you have for an individual that wants to, you know, really, um, they're looking at their health and their health outcomes and they're saying, I want to do something about this. How do they make that first step into that patient journey? Yeah, that's that's a good question. And, I, I, and then the reason why I think it's so important, important is because we are sometimes in our, our little bubble, our little bubble of the fact that everybody here knows that we should start with the patient, we should talk about the patient, and we should not assume. But your doctor doesn't, and your the specialist doesn't, and you still want to see that specialist. You'd still like to see that doctor. So how do you get them to move in a direction that actually works? Because you kind of need them. So you've got to recognize that um, we have to work with them. Sometimes that may be something like bringing the actual guidelines to them. Like here's a copy of the guidelines or there's new guidelines out and they, they say things about compassion and about asking the patient and working in this right direction. Um, um, and they, I, I, it depends on how you, what your relationship is with the family doctor and the specialist, but don't expect that just because there's a guidelines out that the doctors are going to follow them, are going to be compassionate. Many of them have pushed against this and have said that we don't like these guidelines. We don't like talking to the patient and asking them about their trauma and about their kids. No, 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 no. We're going to tell them what they need to do, tell them they need to eat less, they need to exercise more, they need to, um, you need to take this, you need to do that. We're in charge. So it's been a challenge for us. And... Um, uh, the, uh, so how how we how we do that how we make those next steps I think it's it's a societal next step and I'm I question how we do it just as much as as you do Rachel I don't I don't have the answers but I think that we can advocate for ourselves as much as we can yeah and if I can add a, a couple of tips I often give my clients is your family doctor may not be the right person to ask um, you may need to seek out a specialist who deals uh, like Dr. Wharton, who deals specifically in the treatment of obesity. And I get it across Canada, your options may be very slim, but it's always worthwhile to um, try to find that clinic. And I think Priti can maybe put it in the chat box, a, cl a clinic locator uh, as well. So to change gears mm -hmm. now, I want to talk about um, clinical trials. So I understand that you're doing clinical trials and if there are people who Rachel, do you want to take this question? Sure, I'll take this question. Uh, yeah, so, you know, I think um, the question was going to be that um, we understand, Sean, that you are running some cl clinical trials. And that's of interest to the community because I would say personally for myself, I'm very curious about what kind of research is going on that's going to benefit me in the future. Um, and, you know, I've actually been a little bit tempted. I've, I've heard about a couple of things happening and I'm like, how do I get involved in that? You know, so I, I'm also wondering about the perspective of how does that help our community and maybe even what some of us might even want to get involved. Right. That's a, that's, that's great. Great question. So how, what's clinical trials and how is it working? So there's two kinds of clinical trials. The one arm is academic clinical trials. I work at a university and I have a question about whether um, there is discrimination in this group of people, whether this type of, of um, cell works properly. So that's academic research. And we do some of that. And then there's the big pharma, pharmaceutical research, where they come up with a drug, they've got millions of dollars, and they're going to try this drug in a patient or this surgery in a patient group, et cetera. So we do both of those. Um, it's uh, um, uh, If you're looking to be involved in, in one of the trials with an experimental drug or a new drug, then it's more so that, that pharmaceutical um, uh, lens. The other ones, the academic trials, is where every patient that comes to my clinic, they sign a form that says that I am willing to have my data entered into academic research. 
So I can collate and I can say, I've got 10,000 patients and in my 10,000 patients, this many were women, this many were men, this many lost um, this much weight, this many had psychological problems and, and this many took psychiatric meds. And when they took the psychiatric meds and did the weight management, how did they do compared to those who don't? I can answer questions because you let me have access to the data I have access to the data because I have, um, you're seeing, you're being seen, in clinic, but you have access, you've allowed me access to publish it and to look at it from a, um, we take off the identifier, the patient's never identified, there's no, it's just collated data, just like you live in Canada, we do data um, research on people in Canada all the time. So that is that type of academic data. The next step, the clinical trials where there's a new drug, it's come out by this pharmaceutical company and they want to actually look at it. So, and um, the criteria for those are very strict. You, you, sometimes it's you have to have a blood sugar between this level, or you have to have fatty liver at this degree, and we have to do a biopsy, and we have to do three biopsies of your liver to be able to put you into the study. Those are very good studies, and they help to inform the community, do these medications work? And you don't get paid for it. What you're doing is you're contributing to science, you're contributing to our understanding in the in the um, the 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 uh, the um, field. So so those are the type of studies that we actually do. Mm. And is there anything any really interesting study that's happening that we should all know about? <laughs> right. <laughs> so um, so in terms of the, I I think that the big studies right now are um, looking at the protein molecules, the hormone protein molecules that are injectables. And so the reason why they're injectable medication is because if you put them into a pill and you take them, the acid in our stomach ends up de degrading the pill and you can't, and the, the protein and the protein can't cross into the bloodstream like insulin. Insulin is a big protein. We give it as a injection. These are big proteins too. They're not insulin, but they go to the brain, they go to other parts of the body and they help you to actually feel less hungry in the face of a diet. Uh, so it's, it's, it's important because people go, I, I, don't, I don't always have a problem with hunger or I have this problem or I have these other problems. But it's really important that everyone who goes on a diet ends up getting hunger at some point. So this helps to decrease that hunger to allow you to stay on that dietary regimen to then allow you to use the stored energy in the fat cells for your daily calorie needs. So right now we have um, uh, two we have one medication that is on the market um, for weight management. We have another one that is for diabetes that we use in the weight management field. And we have about a bunch more that will be coming up that may work even better, may work at, at, the, at the range of surgical interventions. You know, surgery decreases weight a lot, but it's a big intervention, right? It's, a, it's invasive, it's a big deal. Um, can we do that with a medication? And right now we're getting some medications that actually have surgical levels of weight loss with an injection once per week. Wow, well, I'm really excited to see what comes out of that. Um, so uh, I really like to go back to this question about starting conversations. And actually this question is around starting conversations with your family and friends, because I think we wanna be able to very comfortably have the discussions like we're having right now, but then also with the people that we love and care most about. And sometimes that's really difficult. So do you have um, any views and perhaps some tips about how we can discuss, you know, living life in a larger body with our family and friends that still think it's about, you know, moving more and eating less. Yeah. So the more that we try to, I mean, I've had difficulties with my family. I mean, I'm one of the lead researchers in this and my family doesn't understand it sometimes <laughs> either. So, so it's really hard. My, my mother will say, what, what is it that you do again? She goes, well, I, don't I think I need to go out and exercise. I think I need, can you tell me what to eat, Sean? I can't tell you what to eat. I want you to eat healthy. I want you to be happy. I want you to be good. And uh, she's the one that taught me that. So I'm not sure why she sometimes asks me the other, the other, the other way. But um, so I, I, I frequently think that the, that the best way is to really talk about love and to talk about the connection that we have and to talk less 
about weight. So we take this sometimes from what we see in the pediatric field. In, 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 in peds, um, uh, um, in the adolescence field at times, what they're oftentimes missing is validation that they're good people, that they're bright, that they're capable, they're missing the acceptance. They know that, that their weight is high and, and they, they should be eating better and maybe they should go be a little more active. What they don't know is, is how many people love them and how many people care about them, how when they wake up in the morning, who do they love and who loves them enough to make sure that they are doing, doing, doing well um, at, that, at this weight, at the whatever weight they're at right now. So that love and acceptance has to happen now. So you need to let your family, don't talk to your family about weight and about the diets that you're on and that you're gonna be doing a keto this and it's gonna be that and then things are gonna get better. No, things are better right now because you're here with them right now and you care about them and you love them right now. And then your ability to take care of your own health is your thing and your ability and you're gonna do the best you can and you're, why do you wanna take care of your health? because you want to be around for them. It comes back to the love again. I love you enough that I want to take care of myself and I'm going to figure out ways to actually do that. If you have helpful things to talk about in a helpful way, then we can discuss it. If you're, if you're not helpful because you don't have the knowledge or you don't, then that's okay. Um, uh, we won't talk about it. I, I know people who can help me to understand the science behind this better. I'll talk to them. But right now, what I need you to do is to, is to be with me and to accept me and to and to enjoy the time that we have. You know, that's such a powerful and important answer. Sometimes our family and friends, you know, they, they want to help, but what they don't realize is if you've struggled with your weight or eating for years or decades, it chips away at your self-esteem. It chips away at your self-worth. And, you know, we're already thinking about it. So that's exactly right. When we can help people build up their self-efficacy, build up their self-worth just as they are, they're more inclined to take the steps and advocate for themselves and have the courage to ask for help at the doctor's office. So yeah, right on, right on target there. Thank you, Sean. Um, so our last question, we ask this of all of our speakers, what can Obesity Matters do as a patient voice to improve access to medical treatment? I think that Obesity Matters can advocate for the fact that this is a scientific and medical con condition that affects the brain, affects your self-esteem, it affects your the way that you feel about yourself, it affects can affect your liver if there's actual toxicity towards it. It's a real thing that deserves real attention, not just passing by attention. And you know what, just just try this book that has a little dietary thing or just go on, just watch um, that Oprah show again on that dietary or the Dr. Ross show again, and it'll be helpful. No, it's beyond that. I like the Oprah show and I, and I actually like Dr. Ross a bunch of times. I, I think he's pretty cool, but um, he does, there are definitely some challenges with giving some false hope. I think at times he gave hope when people, when people didn't have any. And so I sometimes feel for for his 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 um his 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 uh, efforts, but but I think that if that obesity matters can let people know that this is real, and it there are people out there who think about it in this real way, also they really know what's happening with the neurochemicals, with the inflammation that comes from the fat cells, um, with how they can be squashed, and if you're finding pain, the pain could be from the fatty liver, from the heart disease, from the diabetes, from the depression. If you're finding pain from it, then there are ways that it can be treated um, and that we didn't have 15 years ago, 20 years ago. So I think that that's what obesity matters can, can do is to let people know that there's real um, hope um, uh, uh, mm -hmm. for, for treatment and real hope for understanding and acceptance. 
Thank you. Those are great uh, words to end the interview portion. Now the floor is open for audience questions. We will alternate between live questions and the one in the chat box in order of rel relevance. Uh, we encourage you to turn on your camera when you're ready to ask your question, introduce yourself, let us know where you're tuning in from. Um, you can raise your hand virtually um, or you can just turn on your camera and unmute yourself and ask that way. So we already have a hand up. Uh, Roslyn, please uh, unmute yourself. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Sandra, I'm calling from Ottawa, but that was a mistake. But I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Dr. Ward. Oh, that was a mistake. Yeah, thank All you. Right. See you. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. I I think I saw Michelle Shapiro's hand up. Well, I'll let you run it, Sandra. Yeah, but go ahead, Michelle, because I, I don't have it on. Uh, I wasn't scanning. So please go Hi. ahead, Michelle. Yeah, I'm Michelle Shapiro from Thornhill, Canada. I'm just wondering, what do you, I have a thyroid problem. So how do you help people with thyroid problem? And how, what do you, uh, what kind of information should I um and what should I do about it? Because I do exercise, I try to eat healthy, yeah. and I don't find too much of a result. Like, uh, um, right. uh, I don't find I'm losing a lot of weight. Right, you don't find the results. So people oftentimes say that. So we'll go to the, people say, you know, I'm, I'm exercising and I'm eating well, and I don't find that it's helping. And I oftentimes back up and say, it's helping what? It's helping the weight change because they're thinking that the exercise and the and the healthy eating will decrease weight when it doesn't. And right. So always have to really, I have a thyroid problem. And you have a thyroid problem. So we'll talk about the thyroid problem. Yeah. So we always make sure that we try to emphasize to people that that the exercise is not for weight change. It's always to make you healthy and to make you stronger. People don't believe it. They really, really don't. I mean, those will some, uh, sometimes get them to repeat it and say it, but in their hearts, they don't believe. It. They really believe that exercise is always going to decrease weight. But if we can just remind ourselves over and over again that exercise is for health, it's for getting stronger, but it does not decrease weight, but we need to do it. We need to move, we need to stretch, we need to do the things. Eating better and eating healthy doesn't decrease weight either. It just makes us better and makes us have less risk of diabetes, of heart disease, and makes us stronger. So let's always try to eat as healthy as, as we possibly can. The issue of the thyroid disease, um, thyroid condition happens to be one of the, one of the number one things that patients think are connected to their their um, elevated weight. If we were in the 1920s or the 1860s, then yes, hypothyroidism or low thyroid, which makes your metabolic weight lower, could cause elevated weight, right? And then, and a lot of other bad, bad, bad things, but not today. Today, if you have hypothyroidism, we give you thyroid medication and then your thyroid becomes neutral. And you're no longer in a position where your thyroid is causing your weight to go up. Or if you had hyperthyroid, too much thyroid, that's a disease too, then it would be your weight going, going, going down or causing other problems. So today, and the, for the past 50 years, we've had um, a great thyroid medication and endocrinologists and family doctors. Family doctors now treat it because it's easy used to be always endocrinologist, but it's so easy now that we just, it's standard. So we do check TSHs, the thyroid levels um, um, in, in our clinic, not really because we should check it. We check it because we want to reassure the patient that their thyroid level is normal so that that's taken off, off, off of the um, uh, uh, table. The reason why people with hypothyroidism have elevated weight is because they live in this world in 2021 and they're just the same as everybody else with treated hypothyroidism. So now you're, yeah, your hypothyroidism is treated. You're, now you're back to everybody on the screen's challenge with weight. Everybody has weight challenge. So it's not going to be your thyroid level anymore. It's just going to be, it's going to be your genetics. It's going to be the fact that we live in 2020, the fact that we don't have to go to the, um, uh, we don't have limited amounts of food. The fact that our activity level, although it's elevated, it because uh, you're, you're trying to do your thing, it's never going to be to the level that it was in the 1800s. We don't have to go to the well to get water. We don't have to live off of the land. So there's no exercise. You can be in the gym all day. 
all day long. You could own a gym and exercising or be a trainer. You'll never get to the level of activity that you, we had when you, we needed to, to be active to, to live, just to get water and to eat and to eat food. So that's, that's the unfortunate thing about exercise. So do it for health and everything else, but. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank that's you for the question. Thank you. Um, Preeti, do we have anything in the chat box before I go to the next raised hand? Yes, there's actually a lot. Uh, there's one by Therese, which was addressed, but I will read it out and you can touch on it briefly because I wanna make sure that we're covering everybody here. Uh, so Therese uh, says, what is your thought on talking to patients about the benefits of lifestyle change, even in the absence of weight loss? That is, sometimes patients have been taught to believe that weight loss, weight loss fixes everything and they don't recognize that being active, eating healthy can improve blood pressure, lipid levels, et cetera, even if there's no weight loss. That's a great quote and, it's, and we have evidence for that. We have actual scientific evidence that if you, so if I, 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 I do these talks and I'm at a, at a big um, uh, lecture on high blood pressure and I say to everybody, Everyone knows what the diet is for high blood pressure, and they all say it's not actually the DASH diet, because we have a really good clinical trial and evidence to say that the DASH diet helps blood pressure to go down and to get better. But what does it do for weight? Nothing at all. It doesn't do anything for weight, it just, which is fine. It just treats blood pressure and does a great job. And if we think about heart disease, what diet treats heart disease? disease. I bet you, you guys, if you took yourselves off mute, you'd be able to scream it out to me. The Mediterranean diet, we all know that. Does it do anything to weight? No, it doesn't do anything to weight. It just makes your heart better. So your statement was wonderful. Being active and eating healthy foods makes a difference in our health, and we have really good evidence to show it. Um, and and uh, obesity is a different disease than hypertension, than heart disease, than epilepsy, and requires a different level to be able to actually decrease weight and keep it down longer. It's been shown that this was much harder, which is why the science is so much behind, because it was really hard to do. People were like, forget it. I'm not doing this anymore. I tried. I'll work on hypertension. That's easier. Come up with the DASH diet. I'll work with heart disease. I'll come up with the Mediterranean diet. This is way easier than weight. I can't deal with it. I keep trying and trying and trying. We do all these trials and nothing seems to work. I'm out. Um, and um, and I, I don't think that's unreasonable for people to be out when it comes to nutrition trials for weight. Nutrition trials for weight have failed us. They continue to fail us. Um, and we're doing less of them now, thank goodness, because we finally <laughs> learned that it's not the nutrition trials are for health and other trials are for decreasing weight. The ones that we, that Rachel asked me about in terms of which clinical trials, as you notice, none of them that I talked about had anything to do with dietary intervention. They all have to do with neurochemical hormone changes within the body. Yeah, I think that speaks to the fact that there is no perfect diet out there. Um, so we're gonna move on to Steven. Steven, do you want to go ahead, unmute, let us know where you're calling in from and ask your question. Thank you, Sandra. Hello everyone, um, my name is Steven. I'm from Malaysia, a family doctor. So uh, I have two questions for Sean. So uh, it pertains to today's topic about mapping the patient journey and using the five A's approach as a practitioner. Um, we want to agree with treatment strategy number one and also agree on treatment target. So the agree part. And from my experience in treating patients living with obesity actively, when we successfully get the goals of our treatment, which is the health of patient with uh, improvement on diabetes control, hypertension control, uh, with certain reduction of weight, which is not our primary outcome, of course. But at one point, patient, their, their aim become, hey, doc, I know I have improved my health, but I want to look good now. Mm -hmm. So how do you approach this type of patient? They want further reduction. So number one. And number two, um, agreeing to treatment options. So as I know, in Canada, you do not have fentanyl, And in Malaysia, we do not have propion. So for me, it's like a, it's a barrier for obesity treatment. 
And on behalf of patients living with obesity, even myself is struggling with weight also. I felt that how, how, how we as a advocates and practitioners going to help in this situation in giving more options to our patients? When you don't Thank have you. the options available. Those are great questions. Okay. Um, uh, so the first question is, should patients want more um, when it comes to weight loss? Their health has gotten better. They've done the right things in terms of eating better and being active. And now they're like, yo, yeah, hey, I still want to go down and wait, by the way. Um, uh, is that is that okay? We almost make it feel at times like um, it's not okay to say, I would like more weight loss. I'd like to go down further than the 5% um, that is stated. And I think that that is wrong, that doctors should um, recognize when patients say that they would like to decrease more and to help them to understand what is available, what's reasonable and what is available. Just like somebody who has pancreatic cancer or, or a bad cancer says, I want to actually live. I don't want to, if a person said, I'm, you know what, we've got some stuff and I'll give you um, two more years of life. They're like, yeah, thanks, but I actually want more than that. I want to actually survive this. So it's not unreasonable to say that you want to survive. It's not unreasonable to say that you would like the weight decreased also, as well as the, as the, as the health changes. The question is whether we can get there or not. Um, and sometimes we can't. Sometimes we can't save somebody who has pancreatic cancer, but they can want to survive. But right now we don't have treatments and they die, most of them. Um, so can we get somebody from a BMI of, of um, 50 who goes down to a BMI of 45 and their conditions are better, things are looking good um, uh, in terms of their health, and they say that they want to be lower down to 30. I still recognize it. I still say that that's, re that's for real, man. I, I get it. I, I, but we don't have it yet, not right now, maybe in 15 years or 20 years, but I'll keep working with you. That's why we're here. So I think that that's what we should do. We should agree to work together. I don't like the agree on the goals and agree on the weight change. I don't like that. I think we should agree to work together, agree that we'll do the uh, work to, um, uh, on a consistent basis to get you the best care that, that you can possibly get. Um, and then the next question is, is if you don't have medications that are uh, that some countries have and other countries don't and a little bit back and forth. The whole field is new still. So um, I think that eventually we should have medications in most countries that are effective. When the world agrees that obesity is a, a real thing, it's a real challenge, then there'll be agreement on real medications that actually really work as opposed to fake ones. Um, and then most of the world should be able to get access to it. Until that time, it's going to be just as frustrating as a world, as a country not having a democratic government or and I'm like they, I, I'd like a better government in my country, but I don't have it. Um, yeah, you don't fight. That's you have to fight for it. You have to fight for for the change. We, we you you'll have to fight in Malaysia to get the GLP-1 analogs. Um, and to get uh, um, the other oral oral meds, um, and uh, and we will fight to get things here in Canada that 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 uh, we don't have, which is where the patient advocacy really works. Thank you, thanks, you, Stephen. Uh, Preeti, over to you for a chat box question. For sure, I have one from Lynette. A uh, question for Dr. Wharton: In your clinic database, do you see certain eating patterns interfering with the efficacy of GLP receptor agonist drugs. In my experience, people who skip meals have less weight loss on these medications, but I wonder if other clinics see this pattern. Yeah, great question. So do eating patterns affect the way the medication works? And the answer is no, they really don't if they look at big databases. So we don't ask patients when they come into the clinical trial, are you skipping meals? Are you only eating in the morning? Are you doing this? Are you emotionally are you an emotional eater or stress eater? Are you hungry, not hungry? We don't ask them anything. We just put them in the trial and they do well. And so it's like, well, oh, I thought it was specific to hunger. I thought it was specific to this. I thought it was, yeah, doesn't seem to be, it's, it's just that, that, that this, um, uh, these medications, what we want them to do is we want them to work in all situations, regardless of what the eating pattern or the psychological or the stress pattern is. That's the way we see it in heart disease. In heart disease, right, the person has a, 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 has, has a blockage within their, within their coronary artery. We don't ask them questions. We just put the stent in. 
because we know it. We know it's going to work, and we don't. We just give them aspirin. You know, if they're a bleeder, then there's something specific. Then we do look at that. But in general, we want medications that work for everybody, regardless of their emotional state, their stressor state, or the reason why they got the um, uh, um, the blockage in the first place. The reason why the weight weight went up in the first place. We want a, a, a pervasive medication that works regardless of the actual reason. And that's what we're seeing here um, when we look at the at the at the bigger databases. Will you get individual stories? Absolutely. Like this, it didn't work for me. It didn't, but on a, on a societal level, it overall works. Thank you. Andrea, you have your hand up. Please unmute. Let us know where you're calling in from. Yes, I'm Andrea, and I'm calling in from Saskatchewan, Canada. And it's so good. I, I just loved hearing the, the, the uh, information that Dr. Wharton has shared today. And <coughs> how easy it is to communicate in this forum and forum and to, to hear other people's questions as well. Um, I, it's been a year, but I joined a wonderful group and I learned about all kinds of things, including the connection piece and just how supportive we are with each other. I'm part of three sales with Dr. Sandy and Sandra. Mm -hmm. And I heard about uh, something called low dose naltrexone because I've got Hashimoto's had it for years um and my I got a new doctor who because I've been asking my same doctor for years you know why can't I lose weight and he would say things like well you're old now you just need to accept it and that's the way it is and um and including with my menopause kind of lumping me into that whole thing too and they're oh doc these hot flashes he said look you're old now. You just, it's a part of maturing. You just have to accept it. So you that's got another doctor. Excuse me. <laughs> uh, well, that's my old doctor. My new doctor tried me on just 0 0.05 of naltrexone. And you know what? My hot flashes went away, which I didn't expect, but also it stopped my weight loss stall and I didn't change anything in my diet whatsoever. And I just wonder my gosh, like 0 0.05 of the cheapest medication I've ever bought. Yeah. And I'm just thinking, and I said to him, like, why are doctors so reticent? And he just said, don't even ask. So I didn't yeah. ask twice, but I'm kind of curious, like, right. why, are so, reticent? why are we reticent to do that? So I can answer that question um, uh, for sure. So, so naltrexone, so everybody knows naltrexone is a medication that's indicated for uh, addictions. It's an opioid blocker. Right. So if you happen to have uh, opioid overdose, if we give it to you, it'll block the opioids and you'll be able to end up coming out of that opioid addiction. Um, uh, if you're on Tylenol number threes and we give you naltrexone and you're using that for pain, the pain will come back because the opioid isn't working anymore. It comes in a 50 milligram dose pill. So five zero, 50 milligrams. And um, and it's taken once daily for alcohol addiction and opioid uh Addiction. That's the indication. There's no indication for weight management for it. And, um, and it's not even really been looked at all that much in terms of weight management. Maybe it may be in food addiction, it would work because it seemed to work in alcohol addiction and opioid addiction, those two words again. So maybe food addiction, it may actually be effective. Nobody wants to actually do a big trial on it because it's not a medication that makes any money anymore. Right. It's not a, it's not it, it is it is not indicated. Um, and so it would be it would be a bit challenging to try to try to see whether it does actually have the impact on food addiction that we think it does. And food addiction would need an official definition and a bigger trial, et cetera, et cetera. So why your doctor is reticent to do it is because we doctors in Canada don't like to go off label. We're not like and kind of in the States where they're a little bit more cowboys and they will do stuff a little bit. We just we because you could could run into problem. Uh, naltrexone could um, exacerbate a seizure activity. It could, uh, it, there's other th problems that could happen. If it does that and you have a seizure and you drive your car into a pole, that doctor's going to jail. And because the college is not going to protect him, I'm not going to protect him because he needs other doctors to back him up to say that was, so someone could die on a medication, but if all doctors say that, well, that was a reasonable 
medication to use. It was reasonable risk. If we patiently they talked about it, it was a reasonable thing. The other doctors will end up backing them up. We won't back, back them up in this case because it's not what we do. We don't, rec we, don't rec we don't have any clinical trials for it. We don't have any reason to do it. So he's, he's out on a limb for you. He's doing a good job. Nice guy. Oh, I'm so impressed. And also nice. there's there's tons of us. There is, I think there is double blinds, uh, not here in Canada. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, that would be interesting to see. And I think yeah. we're open to it. We're definitely open to it. But the field of medicine is we're a little reticent. Um, uh, we're a little hesitant to push forward with things that are off label kind of stuff. So this includes, so we talked about now Trexone here, but if anyone else has any other questions about anything else like that, it's the same answer. It always ends up being the same answer. Well, my doctor tried this thing or is doing this thing, or I read on the internet this thing and I used a little bit of this now it's great and my whole life is better and I feel terrific. We're still not gonna use it or do it in all people because medical legal wise, if there's no real clinical trial and we can't do it safely, then somebody's going to run into trouble and you don't want to be that somebody. That 99 people do great, one person does really badly. That doctor gets in trouble. So, so we at the college and I'm at the college, um, we don't let doctors do things that are um, off label because it's, it's, it's worrisome. But I, we, don't dis, we don't completely disagree with it. Um, and I think that clinical trials will be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Uh, back to you, Priti, for the chat box. Yes. Thank you, Sandra. Um, I have two questions that I'm actually going to club together. So Nicole has said, what are those medications? I'm taking Contrave and Ozempic. They help a lot. And I'm going to also include a question from Diane, where she asks, are these medications affordable for those of us on fixed incomes? Two good questions. So the medications I talked about that are approved here in Canada is, so there's one called um, uh, Saxenda. It's an injectable once a day. It works really well. It's a GLP-1 analog, the injectable once a day. There's Contrave, which are pills. That's a combination of naltrexone and bupropion. So we just talked about naltrexone, but it's with the bupropion where the clinical trials were done and, and together those two things work well. And then there is Ozempic. Ozempic is a new one. It's not approved for weight management as yet, but all the trials have been done and it's at Health Canada waiting for the approval. We think the approval will come in the fall. It's an injection once every week. And that has been, that's been a game changer. We're seeing weight loss next to the surgical levels. The next medication that's coming is one called Terzepatide. It's in early trials. It's mainly a diabetes drug now, but they're doing four weight management trials in people without diabetes. Terzepatide, hard to spell, hard to pronounce. Um, and it is from Eli Lilly. So you can see there another, other companies are coming into this field. Companies don't like the obesity field. They don't like dealing with the obesity field because it's difficult. Everybody has their own idea about what weight loss should be, how they should do it. There's side effects. The side effects aren't tolerable. There's litigation, there's lawsuits, there's problems. So if you're a multi-million dollar company, you'd rather do heart disease or high cholesterol. Obesity is not the field you wanna get into because you may not make your money back. You may not do well in the field. So it's a big deal when a company decides that they're going to advance a drug outside of diabetes into the weight management obesity field. So we push for it. We get angry about it. And we say, why aren't they doing it? If you own the company, I'm not so sure you would, and you had shareholders, I'm not sure it would be what you would decide to do. But we, we do push, we do advocate for it. And we're trying to make the field more, more like other fields where, where there's a benefit and there's a, um, a reason to actually, to actually do it. Um, and the other question was, uh, yes, the other oh, um, the, the cost of the medications. So are they affordable? N so uh, to a large degree, no, they aren't. They aren't affordable. That's why this group is here. This is a patient advocacy group because they're not affordable because um, uh, I, I believe that there's not enough understanding of what obesity is and you and there and there needs to be more anger and then needs, needs to be more um, advocacy, anger, which leads to advocacy. So things like like my insurance company doesn't care about me because they will not cover 
my weight management medication. My MPP, my minister of parliament doesn't care about me because I asked them to work on obesity treatments and, and provide for surgical intervention and provide for medications that are effective. If you don't care about me, I'm not voting for you. I'm gonna find somebody who does care about this field and about me and I'll vote for them. And I'll pay an insurance company that cares about this particular item. I'll take my money elsewhere, thank you very much. That's advocacy. And so yes, it, they are expensive and yes, you should be angry and, uh, and, um, and, and push the envelope to make an actual change because diabetes medications aren't expensive. High blood pressure medications aren't expensive. Cholesterol. So is it possible to have cheaper? Absolutely. They're not doing it for you because we have, we have to advocate more and I can't advocate because as the doctor, they're like, oh, of course he wants that because it's his field. You guys need to advocate. You're the ones who pay the insurance. You're the ones who vote for the politicians. Thank you. Um, so we have another live question. Roslyn, did you, uh, I don't know if that was a mistake again, or do you have a question? No, that wasn't a mistake, Sandra. Thank you. Um, again, I am taking bupropion and naltroxone. And if I'm not mistaken, I can't remember Dr. Warden, if that was given to me in place of the contrast, uh, is that possible? Yeah, I just can't possible, remember. But it wasn't by, I, I, it I, wasn't by our, our clinic. We don't usually separate the two medications. No, no, no. Yeah, I, there, there are some doctors who no. will separate uh, them because they're to, separately. Well, because it's cheaper than Contra for one thing, and it's cheaper than Sixenda for another. And um, the government will not cover bupropion if it's for weight loss. So it was given to me as a weight loss um, substitute to go with the naltrexone. Yeah. So that is not something that you support then, is that correct? It's not something that I support at my clinic because it's off label. And again, I don't think you'll have, uh, your doctor won't have a defense. If something happens to you and your doctor gets called up by the college, will other mm -hmm. doctors support that treatment option? A couple will because some are moving in a direction too. So I think that that's kind of okay. But in general, it's not been regarded as supported yet by the medical field. Don't forget, I'm a, I'm a doctor in a field where I've got to continue to keep my license. This mm -hmm. is not a, this is a real thing. Yes, I want to advocate for as many different options as possible. And I'm open to them. I'm open to clinical trials. But I still got to practice as a doctor. And then I have to, and then we have to push research, which is where that research question, this would be an academic research question because there's no, there's no um, um, uh, pharmaceutical company that's interested in doing two separate drugs that are dirt cheap anymore. So we'd have to do an academic research trial to show that it works. And then, and then you'd have support, right? If something happened to a patient, you'd go, well, I have supportive information that this was a good thing to do. And I have other doctors who will back me up. Then we're okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, one was my medical doctor and one was a weight management doctor and both um, the naltroxone, they didn't want to increase it, but they did increase the bupropion. Yeah. And so what type of things could happen? I, well, there's seizure risk. I'm going to have to go back to questions. No, no, no. I think you're okay. I think there, so there's risk of all the side effects. Every one of the side effects that are, that, that are listed. We can't use them people who have excessive high blood pressure. We can't use it if you've had previous seizures. Can't use it if you have alcohol because then it'll block the alcohol and then the bupropion level will go up and it can cause a risk of seizures. Um, uh, there's, um, so there's side effects, just like any other medication has side effect profile. Without the clinical trials, we can't back it up. But there are some doctors who will do it. And maybe in the next um, three to five years, we'll all switch to it to using it separately because mm -hmm. it's cheaper and it's uh, available. But today there's a bit of a debate and the more people are on the side of, of I don't do it as, as separate medications and some people are on the side as I'll do it separate. I think the shift will come in the direction of us moving towards more doctors doing it as a separate medication. Thank you, thank you. We have okay, time for thank one, you, last, Dr. one yeah. last question from the chat box, Priti. Yeah. Away. Yeah, so I'm, I, there are more regarding medications, but I do have Michelle who wants to know, I don't think we've heard the message of love and acceptance. So uh, I think we are, well, she wants to hear a little bit about the love and acceptance part of our whole treatment. So if you can please elaborate on that. 
Great. I, and I think you're, you're absolutely right. When I first started in this field, I took it the same way I did with all the other fields and high blood pressure, diabetes, you're sitting in front of me because you clearly want a treatment option and you want me to tell you which medication you want me to tell you, tell you, tell you what to do. And I learned that that wasn't true. That's not what they wanted. They, they were sitting across from me for, for me to validate how challenging it was and that there may or they may not be options and that um, and to help them to understand who cares about them and that I care. Um, so and so I've started to use the uh, um, that I've started to say, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you for starting this journey because it's not an easy one and you've done it more than once and yet you're willing to try again. I'm very proud of you for doing that. I'm proud of you. We're now at visit number 10 of you for sticking to it for coming back to visit number 10 that's a lot and you're still here you're still with it you're still working on it that's that's a big deal even sometimes when you went off track when went on track you didn't you're not giving up and I, i'm really pleased that we're working and i'm proud of you validation validate their effort and their 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 the challenge and that shows love and acceptance and you know being an ethnic minority in um, in in uh, North America, which has had challenges on this soil for in terms of black people and indigenous people. Um, frequently, the idea of validation and acceptance is something that resonates. And uh, I certainly would, uh, I mean, if, if I would like it for myself, I certainly think that my patient would want it also. What a wonderful way to end today's session. What a great, great message. I think it's important to understand that, you know, behind every um, obesity stat that's out there, there's an actual real person living with this condition and faced with the emotional, physical uh, challenges and that it really is vulnerable to talk about it and it's vulnerable to start taking those first few steps and we're very fortunate to have doctors like you who are paving the way and inspiring and educating other doctors to do the same so thank you so very much um i want to just reiterate my biggest takeaway from today was that the guidelines have banished bmi that weight is not the only factor in obesity and that lends itself to acceptance of all shapes and all sizes. Rachel, what's your biggest takeaway? Um, well, I loved that we got really deep uh, in the area of love in this conversation. And I would say that for me, um, it's just the, the affirmation that no matter what my size, I deserve to be loved deeply. And also, I have the capacity to love others deeply. So it's really about love. Yes. And you are loved, Rachel. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hugs from Toronto all the way over to Newfoundland. <laughs> so, I want you all to consider getting involved as a member of Obesity Matters community. We will be sending out a survey and we'd appreciate that uh, you taking a few moments to complete it so we can continue to build programs that are recommended uh, by our community. Be sure to tune in next Thursday, June 10th at noon um, for the topic of can cooking be a form of therapy and our guest will be Dr. Sandy Van. So thank you again, everyone. Enjoy.